Okay, screening with chest sonography, how to think about it. And I've already introduced the panel members. Disclosures, you stared at. One of the things that got me thinking about this is there's a lot of chest x-rays being done still. Um, and I bring up the tuberculosis as just one area. This is from the WHO. And uh, they, in, in their recent report, they, they, they talk about chest x-rays now. This is from the WHO. This is a quote. The chest x-ray is being promoted as a useful tool that can be placed early in screening, the screen and triaging process. Um, and, and what they're really saying is that, uh, that they're recommending it, uh, both for screening and triaging, depending on the country. And there, there's literally million, 8 million, I think it was 8 million cases of TB in the last year. Uh, globally. Uh, so it, it's just an enormous problem and there's enormous numbers of chest x-rays being done. And, you know, we think of add-on value, surely this is the place where we could get added on value. And here, this is just a, a list of countries and you can see uh, how many countries are doing screening, either doing chest x-rays, either for screening or triaging or for the next step in the workup for somebody with any type of symptoms. These are 20 some odd countries and they're, they're high population countries, including India and China, which are doing a lot. And, and the country's not listed uh, here. I know there are many countries in Eastern Europe that are using chest X-ray as well as primary uh, tools for uh, tuberculosis screening. So it's just a tremendous area where I think we could find a lot of lung cancers, probably even more than we do with chest X CT screening. So where are we with chest X-ray screening? Why am I, Jim Mulshine said to me, why are you talking about chest X-ray screening at a CT screening for lung cancer conference? Um, and so it's a pretty good question actually. Uh, but he, here's the thought, you know, prior to, uh, prior to the NLST, uh, this was the recommendation, uh, routine screening, for lung cancer with radiography or sputum and asymptomatic persons is not recommended. It literally received a D recommendation, basically saying there was evidence, there was fair evidence against this being used. That was the state prior to the NLST. After the NLST, this is where we're at. Low dose computer tomography, this is also US Preventive Service, low dose computer tomography has high sensitivity and reasonable specificity. Uh, for lung cancer with demonstrated benefit. Other potential screening modalities that are not recommended because they have not been found to be beneficial include sputum cytology, chest radiography, and measurement of uh, biomarker levels. So this is still, you know, on the uh, National Cancer Institute website. And here, uh, direct, sorry, that was US Preventive Services. This is National Cancer Institute website. Does screening with chest radiograph Chest x-rays reduce lung cancer mortality. There's a one word answer there that they say. The first word is no. So this is the current sort of general belief about where we are with chest x-rays. Now, Claudia made this statement. I think it's worth thinking about this. This is from David Eddy and in his statement, and Robert, uh, I know knows David Eddy or knew David Eddy quite well during those screening years. Uh, he, he made the statement that screening should not be recommended in general, nor by a physicians for their high risk patients. And as he was saying that if it's not recommended in general, you can't be recommending it to individuals because if you do enough individuals, you're recommending it in general. That was sort of the way he was phrasing it. And he, he goes into some detail about that. But I, I want to think about this sort of logically. It should not be recommended in general, nor by physicians for their high risk patients. Well, if this is true, then sort of the converse is also true. If it is useful in high-risk individuals, then it naturally follows that it would be useful for high-risk populations. Same kind of reasoning, because ultimately enough high-risk individuals become the population. Same reasoning. So let's just hold that thought for a moment. Now, this was a paper that Oli had written, um, and he was talking about CT scanning, but he was also talking about chest x-rays. And he used to, this used to, 
I use the word bother him, but he, he made this point to me many times. It's necessary to be clear for a start on what community medicine authorities on health policy are not saying. Given a non-calcified nodule identified on computed tomography or of the chest, whether carried out as a first test or in pursuit of our early diagnosis of lung cancer for some other reason. And this applies to chest x-ray also. Um, so no agency issuing health policy proclamations questions the justifiability of the nodules diagnostic workup with a view to possible malignancy. Really important. Nobody questions this. If somebody has a nodule on a chest x-ray, nobody questions from a clinical perspective that you must do something about this nodule. If you don't, big trouble. And similarly, if the nodule is found to be cancer, Nobody questions the idea that that nodule needs to be treated, right? These are unassailable. Um, and what he says, what he used to argue was if these two facts or these two statements are true, then there's no question you should be looking for it in high individuals. Uh, his view was the only problem that happened was that the community medicine folks got involved in what's really a clinical problem. And they said, no, no, you can't just say you need to look for it. Even though those two things are true, the community medicine folks said you have to do population kind of studies and think of it not as clinical problem, but think of it as a, think of something like screening as a community medicine problem, kind of like, uh, you know, treating, you know, pandemics or thinking of it that way and invoking the need for RCTs rather than saying, no, this is a clinical problem and these clinical aspects are true. Therefore, it's worth looking for it. So he was basically saying, there's no reason you shouldn't be looking for it in high-risk people. That was his, his view on the topic. And he also reanalyzed the Mayo Lung Project, which as everybody knows, talks about having no mortality benefit. It's really a very interesting uh, way that he did this. Um, and I'm not gonna go into it, but he, he took into account all, all of the various aspects of uh, contamination, uh, et cetera. And he felt that even the Mayo, uh, was potentially had up to a 40% reduction in the fatality rate if you look at the confidence intervals. So he didn't feel that that was a negative study. So this is a, a pretty serious uh, statement. Now, this is from the NLST consent form. And it's really interesting. Although it's known that spiral CT can detect smaller cancers than chest X-ray, it's not known whether screening with this new test will prevent lung cancer death. And that was really the guiding principle behind NLST, was the idea that we didn't know whether smaller is better. It's really, you know, and, and they say it very clearly in the protocol. We just don't know. We don't know whether something found on a CT scan, maybe in the five millimeter range, is more curable than something found that's two centimeters in the chest x-ray range. And in order to, to, to learn this, we need to do a trial. And, the trial was designed as a test of hypothesis, which is, you know, beyond what I want to talk about today, um, because I always felt, and, and our group always felt, that it wasn't so much a test of hypothesis, it was rather an understanding of the magnitude of the difference. We always felt that chest x-ray surely um, provides some benefit, but we don't know the magnitude of the benefit, nor do we know the magnitude of the benefit of the CT scan. So just very simply, what leads to mortality reduction in a clinical trial? You know, we, we're all delighted to hear that NLST had a mortality reduction. It basically changed the world, that result, uh, along with uh, the folks in the Nelson. These two trials showed mortality reduction. But how do you get mortality reduction? It's really simple. You've got to be curing some people in that screening arm that would have died had they not been screened. And that's why you see the deaths in the control arm. And regardless of the magnitude at this point, simply, you had to have been curing people with the screening test. That's how you get mortality. And the people you cure, in essence, are the ones that were smaller and diagnosed earlier than the ones that were larger diagnosed later. That's it. That's how you get mortality reduction. Now, what about size? So the this is from the ISLC database. And you can just see, this is 10 year survivals for clinical stage ones. And just look how at each size level, the first, the top 
four are basically, the only difference is size. They're all T1 lesions. Size is the key factor. The smaller they are, the higher the long-term survival. The bigger they are, and eventually the more advanced, obviously, the worse the survival. And long-term survival we use as a surrogate for cure rate. So it's very clear that the T, side, the, T, the T portion of the staging is really the critical component, and especially in the context of lung cancer screening. Now, let's just talk, this is from the NLST, and this is a paper by David Gerarda and uh, Paul Pinsky. And they looked at the survival following stage one lung cancer, because ultimately when you talk about screening trials, it's really, in all essence, you, you're curing the stage ones. That's the majority of your cures. So you wanna look at how much do we cure the stage ones. And, and graph A is stage 1A and graph B is stage 1B and they're comparing uh, CT scanning in red to M, uh, from the NLST to the blue, which is um, the chest X-ray arm in the NLST. And the third is the, the bottom one is the SEER database. And stage 1A on the left, stage 1B on the right. And, and look at that. They're both really similar. The long-term survival's there, and here they are. You can see uh, the five and 10-year survival in the NLST for stage 1A is five years, 86%, and 10 years, 70, 74% compared to chest X-ray, which was 82% and 64% at five and 10 years. And stage 1B is almost identical. So you can see that if we're curing the chest X-ray stage ones, this, this, sorry, we're clearly curing a large proportion of the chest X-ray stage ones, C, sorry, the CT scan stage ones of the NLST. That's how we got the mortality reduction. We were curing a lot of those stage ones that we found with CT screening. But we also see that in the chest X-ray arm, we're curing those also. They're the same long-term survival rates, basically. So we have to be curing some of them. Therefore, there really has to have been a mortality reduction. We just weren't able to show it. So there were clearly substantially less stage ones in the chest X-ray arm than the uh, CT arm, but there were some, and you can see they do incredibly well. So this is really about the magnitude. And that's really where I think we need to keep thinking about the chest X-ray. It surely has a benefit. I think that's just unassailable that the CT scan had a benefit because it found them stage one and small and has long-term survival like that, then the chest X-ray has to have had that as well. And just for this topic of overdiagnosis, briefly, this has been used as a, a reason for why chest X-ray wasn't uh, useful. The Mayo Lung Project, they reported 50, over 50%, uh, and there are numbers even higher estimates of the percent of overdiagnosis in the Mayo Lung Project. Now it's interesting, the Mayo Lung Project should have had the least amount of overdiagnosis because they excluded the baseline round in their analysis. And the baseline round is where you would think most of the indolent cancers were. Mayo excluded that. They reported 51%. The PLCO, uh, which was done years later and included the baseline round, the report there is there's only 6% overdiagnosis. Again, chest X-ray screening. Now, how can that be? And then the NLST, which is even more sensitive, the more sensitive test should have a greater amount of overdiagnosis. They report 18%, and if you exclude the BACs or the non-solids, it's down at 3%. So I just say overdiagnosis and the way it's reported and the way it's thought about is really a mess. Uh, the DLCT, the Danish lung cancer study, and the Italung study were designed very similarly. It's almost the identical protocols. One reported an overdiagnosis rate of 67%. One reported virtually a 0% overdiagnosis. This is a real problem. Um, and and it's, it's a little beyond the scope, but it's clearly something is on here that, that's not right. So these are the questions I'm gonna to present to the panel members and I'm eager to hear their thoughts about this. The first question, if CT screening reduces mortality by finding cancers earlier than symptom prompted, does that imply that chest X-ray also reduces mortality to a lesser extent? And secondarily, that improvements in CT where you'll find them even smaller will, re will further reduce mortality. 
I turn this over to the panel. Um, anybody like to start first? Robert, would you like to take this first? Voice from on high, speak to us. Yeah, happy to. And is uh, is this is this level of volume okay? Yeah. All right. Good. Yes, it's good. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, very very often, and and when we evaluate technology and we get a better technology, we leave the old one behind. And I think a, um, a, a, a really good example of some clearer thinking about this came from the um, uh, breast cancer, you know, where we demonstrated that mammography was efficacious in reducing breast cancer deaths. Um, slowly chest, I mean, slowly clinical breast examination fell by the wayside. Uh, we saw improvements in mammography, so we keep moving on forward and forward and forward, but we're largely leaving the majority of low and middle income countries without much in the way of an early detection strategy for breast cancer. And it became very clear about 20 years ago that you could aggressively promote downsizing and thus somewhat downstaging breast cancer in countries that could not afford mammography or for which it is not feasible. So the more we scrutinize the chest X-ray data, you see that it has, as you've been describing, some potential to detect early lung cancers. And then the question would be is, well, do we try to utilize it to our best advantage in settings where CT isn't, um, uh, isn't efficacious or you know, isn't cost effective, or do we just, you know, um, do nothing. You raised a number of issues, which I think are really important, which is that we're probably already picking up a lot of nodules and imaging for other purposes and not acting on them. That actually happens quite often in CT, which has been a huge concern that when CT is done for other reasons, uh, you can see a nodule, you can even report it, but it doesn't mean anybody's responsible for following it up. The other issue I think you'd have to consider is do you have the capacity, if you have the capacity to do chest x-rays and are doing chest x-rays, do you have the capacity to increase that utilization for lung cancer screening and do you have the capacity for diagnosis and treatment? There was a really interesting article, um, and then I'll, I'll let, let the other panelists speak, showing how you could measurably improve the detection rate of lung cancer with a um, deep learning algorithm that uh, basically performed as well, but actually better than the radiologists. And that suggests, you know, further potential for accurate utilization of the technology in settings where uh, there simply aren't enough trained radiologists. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, Bruce, you wanna comment? Dr. Uh, Taoli for help with these uh, slides. What I did was um, look at uh, data from NLST, the, the chest X-ray arm, and we uh, um, I built a, a model for the U.S. Medicare program, an illustrative model that's going to take the concept of prime time bonus findings, which is a, a talk tomorrow, uh, but applies it to chest X-rays and. Well, we're waiting for the slide to load. I don't think it's up. We're waiting for the slide to load. There's about 30 million chest X-rays in the U.S. Medicare program each year, and the Medicare program covers about 60 million people. So that's about half a chest X-ray per person, or one for every two people. And uh, uh, do I control this with page down? Do uh, you want me to go next? Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, and the next one. Very good, thank you. So uh, what we found finding in, in the uh, NLST is that about 47% of the uh, lung cancers discovered in the chest X-ray screening, not incidentally, not symptomatically, but through screening were uh, stage one, and let's ignore all the rest and apply that to the 30 million ch chest x-ray that happen in the Medicare program each year. And, uh, to, and the goal here is to say, 
well, if we have some better technology, some AI that can um, look at these uh, images that are already there for other purposes, how many early stage lung cancers, easy, curable lung cancers are we gonna find just by that? Sort of not using chest X-ray as a screening tool, just closer look at the, the images that are being constructed today. I go through a series of, of decrements here from the 30 million to the 15 million to the 3.75 million saying, well, these are probably the ones that count. Um, and that's probably a low estimate. And if we apply the ratio to those of the annual early stage lung cancers detected, just examining those people, those close to 4 million people, each year we're going to find about 3 million early stage lung, uh, 3,000 early stage lung cancers that we wouldn't have found otherwise. Uh, no extra radiation, no extra procedures, just, just applying some, uh, some AI to the, the images. So whole series of assumptions here, but there's, and this is probably a low estimate in, in, given the, the assumptions I've made. So if we could go to the next slide. Oops. Uh, so I don't see from everything I've heard and uh, I consider myself an outsider, but I don't think we're gonna ever have another NLST, especially that looks at chest X-rays. So we have a wealth of administrative data and a wealth, you know, tens of millions of chest x-rays that we could test this with uh, and uh, populations and answer some of the questions from the data with, that we already have without the need for a randomized trial uh, of which kind of x-ray patients are, are there uh, of the chest x-ray patients that we have currently, how many of them get diagnosed with lung cancer in two years, in three years, in four years, five years. Um, and what would it cost to have follow up on those? So I think we have all the ingredients for a bonus finding um, system for what is current practice with chest x-rays that are being done for other purposes. So. That, that's so I'm optimistic about this, but connected with the bonus findings for chest x rays. Okay. Professor Pachi, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think this is an interesting point, but uh, um, I will start with the real world evidence. The real world evidence, uh, not in terms of chest x ray, but in terms of of uh, lung cancer stage and resection proportion in cancer registry. And we see that it's stable over 20 years. I was impressed by the uh, story by Claudia. In the, when we started uh, in Varese conference and with the ERCAP study, we were get quite clear that uh, we were going in the direction of low dose CT scan because independently from the Mayo Clinic study, there was something more. There was something more, I'm not a radiologist, but I think it was something more in the stratum evaluation, maybe in the straight evaluation in radiology, in the computer tomography. And for this reason, in the last 20 years, Everybody in the world follows this line. And uh, this, there was a stable uh, rate of uh, unresected cases in every country and the late stages in every country. We had in Italy, but also in the cancer registry in the US, we had stable. When we see some change in the last five, six years, there is a Miller uh, rep, et al. Uh, report uh, to the nation of the US in 2022, 
Well, the, for the first time, you see that there is an increasing rate of early stages and a decrease of late stage. This possibly is also an increasing incidence because there is an anticipation, but this means that something is changing. Probably it's too late, it's too early to see something, but at the same time, it's also true that the program in US is not really covering very much at the moment. So if you look at the cancer registry, you see something, but you cannot see everywhere. So that's my first point. The second point, I close, is uh, it's different to have a chest X-ray. I know it's widespread everywhere. As a, the, with the capacity of detecting nodules, which I don't believe very much at the moment, but maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think with the artificial intelligence uh, you can improve what is not there. Artificial intelligence can improve what you, or if you have just one photo, it's difficult, you can have more. But anyway, the, my, my point is uh, it could be a highly indicator. So it could be possible that we use model, models for risk. We know if a person smoking is the easier, but we have other models now. Maybe to have a chest X-ray can be an indicator to be at a higher risk. That could be useful for a better monitoring, but I'm quite doubtful about it. Okay, so we have, I'm not sure if we had two, two yeses and one maybe, and no. Uh, Claudia, can you give us a comment? And by the way, we have two more questions and we have short time. So the next answers for the questions will need to be brief. This one, Claudia, you can, Claudia has slides. Okay. That we, we could include the chest X-ray as prior information and the information that we get on that. I think that the- There is a paper of that by Way Weiss and uh, other people and recently published. Okay, so we're in it. We need to add the chest X-ray <laughs> and, the, and the findings on the chest X-ray. But clearly we showed in the Lancet that um, we find far fewer with the chest X-ray, but certainly we find some. And there's survival, basically my, my slides show that there's survival in the NLST is almost equivalent. It's within the, with chest X-ray, just fewer. Okay, so this is the 10 year survival in the chest X-ray arm compared to the CT arm for stage one lung cancers. And then the next one, next slide, shows it without the BACs and it's even closer. Um, okay, so basically David had shown those, these are just bigger. The chest X-ray survival is very good really compared, yes. it's just less frequent. It's the frequency that counts, but to we should use that information if, you know, on all those people. But uh, here you are the resected. So you don't have the unresected lung cancer. Right. So, okay, but what we want is to, to move and uh, in the population. This is just the cases. So if you, the case, if you detect an early case, right. that's fine. That's fine. But it's not the best but, way to detect. But you detect the early cases with chest X-ray, that's the problem. No, we said that out of the 20, 23 early stage lung cancers we saw with CT, there were only four that were seen. That tells you six times Maybe. more free, yeah. Uh, it's a proportion. Yeah. So to do, yeah, anyway, that's. I think, I think, yeah, we'll go on to the next question, but my simple prep, preposition here is that you're curing some of the chest X-ray detected cancers. And if you're curing some of them, in essence, you're reducing mortality. It's just, you couldn't see it. Right. I, I think that's just an unassailable kind of argument. Uh, the next question, if we can put it back up. Right. We're not gonna have time, sorry. <laughs> I have two more questions. If we can get through that, then we'll take comments. Yeah. 
Well, maybe we should take a comment. <laughs> Matthias, so, why don't you make your comment? Go because, back to David's slide. Because we're, uh, um, we're, we're challenged here. Yeah, just a, a very short remark. I think the whole discussion should be rephrased because it's all dependent on the pre-test probability. And that goes for CT and it goes also for uh, X-ray. And chest X-ray could indeed have some importance, but the pre-test probability is completely dependent on the histology. So for certain histology types, I think indeed chest X-ray could have a benefit. But for example, for a squamous cell or small cell, it will never have any benefit. And of course, populations differ in their pretest probability and their histology type distribution. Next question, and we're going to have to go through this kind of quickly. Uh, will continued improvements in CT leading to diagnosis of smaller cancers lead to increased overdiagnosis, and therefore the need for additional trials? And conversely, does lower sensitivity and detection of mainly larger cancers through chest X-ray lead to reduced overdiagnosis. So it's, if we're finding them smaller, are we gonna get more overdiagnosis? The, the difference between the chest X, the CT scan that I started with with Claudia, we were doing 10 millimeter slice thickness. We're now doing 0.5, that's 20 times smaller. If you think about the difference between uh, the chest X-ray and that 10 millimeter slice, it's less than 20. I mean, so the difference in the new scanners compared to the current CT scanners is greater than the difference proportionally to chest X-ray versus the old CT. So we're getting huge improvements now in sensitivity of what we're finding. Do you think we need to worry about overdiagnosis more now? Is this a problem? Do we need to, like David Eddy say, this is a big problem and we've got to do something about it? Are there trials? Where do you think we're going to stand on the overdiagnosis issue? Who wants to start that? Robert? Two minutes. We got, we got to go fast. Okay. I was asking Robert since he's a... Uh... Okay. Um, I, I think you have to think of screening as a continuum in which you're gathering information and not as a series of discrete steps in which you get right or wrong answers. So I recall years ago, David, you telling me that, uh, and even in some of our annual meetings at uh, IASLC, that we can find some very, very aggressive lung cancers when they're very, very small. And it's good that we do because we lose the life-saving potential earlier with those and some of the other ones. That just means that these patients now are in a surveillance program until the lesion is large enough to effectively biopsy it. So the, the overdiagnosis issue does not concern me. You, you certainly could argue perhaps that somebody older and maybe uh, with competing comorbidity um, could have a cancer diagnosed much earlier. And then that overdiagnosis case would be attributable not to lack of progression, but the patient dying of something else. But um, I, I, I think that the overdiagnosis issue Thanks. is not as important. Okay, we've got just a... Quick answers for this, I guess. Bruce, you want to say something? Uh, uh, in a bonus finding situation where CT uh, chest is, or chest X-ray is not being used for screening, but you're looking at bonus findings of others, the overdiagnosis takes a very different uh, form. So I, I think not confusing that is important. Professor Pachi, I, I think uh, after the long follow-up of the National trial, uh, the national SCT trial, uh, and uh, interlung uh, and other studies, uh, overdiagnosis possibly is not more really a big problem in lung cancer screening. And uh, I think you have to consider that there is a, the second component of the lung cancer screening overdiagnosis, which means uh, if you dying for other causes because it's a, a group of people uh, uh, at high risk for chronic diseases or whatever. So in my opinion, at the moment, uh, I do not care very much about this. Of course, always we have to monitor, but there is no sign that we have a, a big increase in the risk of overdiagnosis. So in my opinion, uh, the problem with the 
with the Chelsea say that if they lose, cancels. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem is if they are, have a good sensitivity in order to, to do the job. So uh, that, that's a major problem. Because if they don't pick up the cases, uh, then uh, you will have no mortality reduction. So. so I would say we understand more about the pathology of, of lung cancers. So we've learned. And the, if you see something on chest X-ray, you normally get a CT scan. So you shouldn't intervene on, I mean, th there's been a marked reduction in uh, surgical approaches to non-solid nodules, for example. So I, and I think we know how to assess growth. Uh, so I don't think it's a problem, the short answer. Okay, and the last question I'm gonna just take for myself <laughs> and I'm gonna give you my comment on it. Will further improvements in chest x-ray such as AI lead to further mortality reduction? Is there any reason to perform trials on this? The reason I bring this up is I, I keep hearing, well, we know the chest x-ray failed, but now we have AI and now chest x-ray could potentially be good. I just want to say that to me, this is just a, a magnitude issue. Chest x-ray clearly is going to cure some of this early lung cancers it finds. The AI is going to just increase that. How much it increases it, that's a question. How many more small nodules do you find? How many more stage ones? It's not a question of if it's going to be or if we need to do trials with, with AI, chest x-ray. I don't think that's the way to think about it. I just think of this as a magnitude issue. And Lori wants to say something because we got to move. Community-based settings that are uh, under-resourced at the moment, but with the vast majority having chest x-rays may not have the money to actually spend on the, a low-dose CT scanner. Is there not a way to think about supporting this in a, um, in a pragmatic way if we're trying our best to find lung cancers at their earliest, most curable stage, and the existing equipment can be enhanced with potential AI. Does that I, help I, I, a resource? I think so. You're seeing this, for example, in South Africa, they're doing yeah. this now. And I think other countries are doing it. I think if you don't have the resources, I think this is a... And it's not just check says right. It's my, with it's, an enhancement, with, yeah. but if it could yeah. help finally. Okay. Thank you very Thank much you. To, to the panel members. Greatly appreciate the discussion.